Hello everyone, my name is Kieran, welcome back to my channel, welcome to the first edition of the Newport County Pre-Match Podcast, first of all on StreamYard, second of all of 2024, because I've not been consistent with these at all, and I probably never will be, but regardless, uh, I'm joined by Chow today, sure he needs no introduction, first of all mate, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your day to talk about, you know, the impending game between Doncaster Rovers and Newport. Yeah, thank you very much. Great to be here on the first one of the year. And um, and yeah, respect to all the Newport fans. And uh, this is going to be a, a pretty good one. I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, I'm also uh, very much looking forward to this one for personal reasons and the fact that the uh, two clubs are so close to each other in terms of the uh, league table. 18th yeah. versus 19th. But I'll go into the kind of first question I've got in terms of uh, you know asking you about Doncaster. There were a lot of people, myself included, who put Doncaster due to their signings and due to all of this and all that, put mm. Doncaster a lot higher up in the table to where you currently are. How is the season kind of uh, met with your expectations? Um, so initially I predicted them fourth because I had this optimism that we'd, we'd have a good year with Grant McCann coming back and... You know, very quickly in the back of my mind, I knew it weren't going to be, you know, a complete uh, good season. We knew it was going to be a season of transition. We knew we were going to have to bide our time and be patient. Um, I think the inconsistency has been there to see. I think the inconsistency has been there to haunt us uh, again this year. Uh, while we, we we sort of sear out the, the dead wood, so to speak, and we, we bring in this new era really which is the the culture that McCann and Cliff Byrne and the rest of the staff want to bring in um it started in the summer with uh with multiple outings multiple incomings uh all of them have brought something different to the squad um I mean I've got to give a special mention to to Owen Bailey um I call him my immortal upon time because he's just he just plays good everywhere around the pitch he's just this this hybrid player that just seems to kill it everywhere he's on the pitch um you know multiple players just adding different traits of course january's come on now we've brought in a few players already that have brought different traits to the squad and are going to bring different traits to the squad and you know for me i think rovers are in this kind of rebuild period i know people are sick of hearing rebuild all the time because that's what we were apparently doing with with gary mcsheffrey and danny schofield but um but overall i think this rebuild i'm the most confident with out of the three um, and I think that Grant is bringing a real change in culture. And I think with the change at the top as well, in terms of chairman change, that, um, with Terry Bramwell stepping in the role, with Gavin alongside him, with Grant. And I think that him, that change at the top will help bring more investment into the squad in January. I think we're starting to see that already. And for me, I feel like it's not it's not our year this year, but if we can if we can get out of it finishing higher than we were last year, which was 18th, and maybe sneak a, a Bristol Street Motors trophy in there, maybe, uh, then I call that a successful season in the uh, in the terms of, of, of progression. Yeah, I, I can uh, entirely agree with that. And it sounds incredibly similar to Newport. I've called this a lot more of a transition uh, season because of changes to the top of the club, you know, to the bottom of the departures and everything else in between. And it kind of you know, is very similar when you look at the league table right next to each other. But you mentioned, of course, you've got a new uh, chairperson in. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a, a kind of meeting where you kind of realised and heard from what they were planning on and kind of uh, the intentions. And what were they? Are they kind of uh, ones where you can kind of have a little bit more confidence for the rest of this season that you won't fall into any trouble? Or is it one of those where you were very, very secure about the long-term future of the club? Um, so obviously we had our owners event uh, this past week and, you know, we have these virtually every season. And it, for, for me personally, it felt a lot more optimistic. I know a lot of our fans were, were not so optimistic on social media after the event and were kind of throwing it down to the fact that we're not, it didn't didn't really sound like we were gonna put loads of investment in, but there's there's fans out there like myself, like Ainsley, like a few other people that are that are confident about what Terry's gonna bring as chairman. Uh, I think initially, I think even the even the new chairman admitted it himself that David Blunt didn't, doesn't want to put any money in and didn't want to put any money in. And when you got a chairman for the last ten years who didn't put any money into the club, 
I'm sorry, that's just inexcusable in itself. And the fact that David Blunt was willing to become a silent shareholder and just be a part of the board rather than the chairman of the uh, of the club, fair enough, right decision. Uh, I don't wish any ill feeling towards David Blunt at all. I've been very professional about my response to the change in chairman, uh, even though the inside fan in me is screaming, yes, 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 he's, he's not chairman anymore. The professional in me states that I wish him the best of luck with whatever he's doing next and uh, and, and his involvement in the boardroom um, rather than being the chairperson. But, you know, I'm confident about Terry Bramall. He's He's been at the club since 2006. He's been part of the good times with John Ryan, um, building that squad up to, to the championship in the golden era, of the modern golden era, uh, when we were leaving Bellevue and heading into the Keepmoat Stadium the first time in 2007. And, you know, for me personally, I think that Terry's a, a very driven man. He's a Doncaster man. He's very, very rich. He's a Yorkshire man. Uh, not Doncaster man, Don Yorkshire man. Uh, very, very rich. And, um, you know, he has got Doncaster at heart. He has got the whole club Doncaster at heart and he knows what he wants to do, uh, which is to make us uh, improve on the pitch with the budget that's required to grant for the January window, the summer, etc. Uh, make us more financially sustainable off the pitch and then and only then we'll be in a position to, um, you know, offer the club for a takeover to someone who thinks they've got the right interests at heart. So I think Terry's the right person at the moment to steer us uh, afloat in the direction where we can then sort of bounce off the, the loading platform and sort of take off with a, with the next era of, of owners uh, in the future. But for now, in terms of steering us up and steering us back on track, I think Terry's the the right chairman to, to do that. I think me and John Ryan spoke numerous times about Terry and you know, John Ryan 100% trusts Terry and I 100% trust him, especially here in the uh, owners event uh, last night. I did ask a couple of questions myself about certain things off the pitch and, um, you know, we got some got some good responses. Um, there was, there's a couple of odd questions in there, but um, but yeah, uh, overall decent and uh, a lot more confident about the, uh, the security of the club and still having a, a football club to go to. Yeah, you know, sounds fantastic when you look at Doncaster, a uh, neutral perspective, because you've got all of the uh, the lower league look, look sports media spaces where there's Doncaster segments and more towards the beginning of the season, it sounded a lot more, uh, more a lot more on the negative side than the positive side. And you never really like to hear that just as a football fan myself. So it's good to hear that Doncaster look to be on that uh, up kind of uphill rise in terms of off the field and potentially on the field, but we'll go more to the, you know, the now this season. And I want to kind of uh, cover this now because uh, I think it's a, a vital thing that a lot of Doncaster fans like yourself, like uh, Ainsley and everyone else have mentioned is that your squad have been through what I can only describe from what I've heard as an injury crisis of a, of a sort. And we've been through one that, you know, was pretty significant on the kind of prog progress we made on the pitch. But we've come through the end of that. In terms of your squad now, of course, it's January, so you can uh, kind of pick and choose who you want to sign to a degree. How is the uh, squad availability going into this game? Are there still uh, loads of injuries or is there players coming back and being uh, filtered in that are vital to how you play? Um, there's been improvement. Uh, there's been improvement in the availability as the weeks have gone by. We've had a couple of setbacks in previous weeks, you know, months ago, but um, the, the availability is improving at the minute. Um, Louis Marsh, who's been injured for the last few weeks now, last couple, month or so, uh, he's gone back to Sheffield United, his loan spells ended so uh and that's quite sad with Louis Marsh because he had a, he had a lot of potential a lot of pace in him we saw that when he came into the club in the summer and you know it felt like we we're going to see a real player in there and then that injury at Mansfield just completely rock bottomed his season um and my only hope now is he goes back to Sheffield and rehabilitates that and just keeps working on it and he can get himself back into a place where he's back competing with the under 21s at Sheffield and back competing for a for a place in that first team with the likes of Oli Arblaster. Uh of course went back from Port Vale uh, earlier this week uh, earlier this month as well. Um in terms of other availability, we know that Bobby Faulkner is now back from injury. We know that obviously we've added to the squad with Connor Carty, with Jay McGrath and the two and a half year deal. 
with Matthew Craig now, with a couple more still to follow that we're working on, uh, at least two or three we're working on, uh, as far as I'm aware. I think that, excuse me, I think that with John Teller coming back in January, I think that's another plus. Uh, he's been someone who's been hit and miss with injuries um, throughout his time at Rovers in the last couple of seasons. We have got four out for the whole season now uh, with, with Lavery out for the whole season, but he's barely, he's played no minutes this season. He's out of contract in the summer, so he's going to go anyway. George Miller, who was our top scorer in a poor season last season, uh, injured for the rest of the season now after a couple of setbacks, which is obviously a shame. Zane Westbrook, who has been a vital part of the midfield in terms of making advanced movements, being in part of the link-up play. He's out for the rest of the season now. That was announced a month ago. So, uh, again, it's, it's sad to see him gone. But Matthew Craig's of a Herbie K. Mulder midfielder, so he's going to take over those Westbrook duties uh, for the rest of the season uh, and also be a number six while um, Bailey plays at centre-back and covers that position uh, while Westbrook's out for the rest of the season as well. And then Ravenhill's been out for the year with the eight, uh, with the, the leg injury anyway. So, uh, so two of them we knew were out for the rest of the season anyway, but two of them throughout the season. So um, I think the biggest thing with injuries was the appointment of our new head of medical, uh, David Rennie. Uh, he has experience with Curzon Ashton, with Bristol City. But the main thing here is he spent 20, uh, what, 20th years, I think, with Leicester City. Uh, so he's been with them through League One promotion, Championship promotion. And the fact that we've got this guy who was part of the medical staff when Leicester City won the Premier League. I mean, this is a huge coup for League Two to get someone who's been part of the staff that won the Premier League with Leicester just seven years ago. I mean, that's just a huge coup for the club um, from the medical side. And the main thing I would say here is to give this man time, because right now he's coming into a situation where he's had a lot of injuries to deal with, a lot of setbacks, a lot of people on the treatment table every now and then. Some players that are even available of the squad have not been 100% sometimes. So, you know, he's dealing with a massive injury list at the moment. I'm not going to use injuries as an excuse for where we are in the table because the results need to be better. But what I would say is I think it's played somewhat of a part in Grant McCann choosing his best available squad because, you know, even in recent games, you know, Fowl's not a winger, he's a striker and he's not the best out wide. But in that in our new, in our 4-3-3 formation, he's having to kind of hew Sean, uh, horseshoe Fowl into that position at the moment rather than compete with Ironside for that number one spot up front. So for me, I think that, um, there's a lot of injuries we've had to deal with and a lot of availability situations we've had to deal with. But I'm not going to use it as an excuse because we know that Mansfield have had injury problems and yet they're in the playoffs despite having two, three years together with Nigel Clough. Uh, other teams have had multiple, multiple injuries and yet they're higher than us in the table. It's about how we deal with our availability. And I know Sir Alex Ferguson once said it's not just about the 1 to 11, it's about the, the 12 to 20 or whatever it was. But um, it's how we deal with our availability the best. And uh, in terms of the medical side, I, I, I'm more than willing to give our new head of medical as much time as he needs to bring down that injury list. And we're starting to see it with the, the lack of unavailability at the moment and the fact that it keeps going down and down and down over these last few weeks is a positive sign. Um, that changes are being made. Grant McCann said in the owners' event that they are in being investigated, and there is investigations going on into what what led to all those injuries that happened um, over previous seasons. Obviously, he can't do what happened with previous seasons, but he's launching an investigation into the current in current situation. So we are taking steps to improve on that. And um, you know, for me, I. Th I, I I can't rate the appointment enough of David Rennie as head of medical. Um, so I think the injury situation will, situation will get better. It's just about how we we deal with it, both on the pitch and in January as well. And I think we're we're dealing with it so far. Yeah, I think you're dealing with it as well. I think the the words kind of describe your form throughout the entire season has been kind of inconsistent and squad availability for the most part from an outsider's perspective has been inconsistent. But you're entirely right in that. You can't entirely use it as an excuse because, like you said, Mansfield, they've had a history of injuries, especially this season, and they're thriving. There's been other clubs that have had it. We've had injuries. We've come through the other end of it, and we're looking a lot better than, you know, what a lot of people were putting us to in preseason. So 
you know, that response I think is absolutely perfect in terms of the uh, the availability and the fact that you've got this new uh, head of medical uh, kind of physio stuff. And it's just, again, it's one of those things where you look a lot more positive than negative from a uh, outsider's perspective. But of course, you mentioned January. It's a relevant topic, you know, where we're what 20 days or so away from the window shutting so there's still plenty of time for a business to be made in terms of potentially your current squad in terms of uh what you want to go into what additions do you need to make this season a success for one in your eyes um i mean after the first three that we made i mean obviously kind of carty on loan from bolton is a pressing forward he can adapt across the front line but he's mainly a pressing forward like a george miller mold uh, so he will fill Miller's role uh, for the rest of this season. And then Bolton will assess where he is in the summer in terms of if he's going to get involved in the first team squad or he's going to go out on loan again uh, with him signing a new long-term contract. Jay McGrath, two and a half year deal, strong, physical, powerful ball playing centre-back. He will uh, add to the current lineup of defenders. Grant McCann has suggested that a couple of centre-backs will go uh, in January, potentially. Uh, definitely the summer but maybe January as well uh, in order to, and it's nothing personal with these guys. It's not because they're not great players overall. It's because they may need to go to get first, to get better chance of first team football, or other clubs in the league or in the league above or whatever, um, or they may get better availability at other clubs, um, whether that be a loan deal or a permanent deal. And, you know, when I look at the current crop of defenders, there is one or two names out there that I could see uh, going. There could be a name out there that I could see going out on loan as well. There's an, so there's a name or two I could see going on loan, name or two I could see getting sold at some point, uh, depending on form and availability. Um, but I think when obviously Matthew Craig coming in as well, defensive midfielder, captain of the Spurs under 21s. Um, I mentioned this when we signed him, actually, he worked with. One of the coaches who's Wayne Burnett, who's got experience of League Two, having been caretaker manager at Dagenham and Redbridge during the three-way relegation battle. And I did mention this to people on my analysis video about the relegation battle in that season between Barnet, Dagenham and Redbridge, and AFC Wimbledon to go down to the to the conference. It was one into two, it was uh, three into one relegation place and ended up being Edgar Davids' Barnet. And Wayne Burnett was the caretaker manager of Dagenham and Redbridge. I think they lost or drew their last game of the season, along with Barnet losing to Northampton. And AFC Wimbledon, I think, won their game. So he's got experience working with a coach who's been a caretaker manager at this level. Um, he's an energetic young leader. He's confident. He's comfortable. He's got this flair about him as a defensive player. He's got an attacking mind as a defensive player. So that's been a good addition to our to our lineup because Bailey's our defensive midfielder. However, he's been covering at centre back and has been our best defender this season. So, you know, you've got Bailey covering there. You need a proper number six in that four three three. And I think Matthew Craig answers that question uh, for the rest of this season. So you've you've got a couple of positions covered there already. Um, when I look at the current lineup, I say we need an energetic playmaker, someone who does the same Westbrook duties. I've said that Matthew Craig can do that, but for me, I think he covers that main primary Owen Bailey role while he covers at centre back. And then you've got Connor Carter, who is the George Miller mole, but can play across the front line. And then you've got Jay McGrath, who can play in the back line as well. So for me, when I look at that current lineup, I think we still need someone to cover Zane Westbrook's duties. We've just loaned Kulea out for a month to Gainsborough Trinity, so we need another winger if Hurst still isn't 100% fit. So I think we need a pacey winger, especially with Tyler Roberts going back to Wolves as well. Um, and I would I would maybe say, and this sort of depends on if we get any setbacks to Maxwell coming back. Obviously, we've got Senior, we've got Sterry, we've got Nixon. I would like to see us maybe potentially looking at loaning in a, a new left-back um, to maybe have someone compete with senior for the rest of the season because Maxwell, depending on where, where he is at the moment, I think Maxwell might be on the way back in a couple of weeks anyway, so that might not be needed. But I would say maybe I would look at another a, a creative midfielder, um, talk of Jack Wells Morrison alone from Crystal Palace, which, by the way, the fact that he was scouted by Championship and League One in the summer and the fact that that's a possible signing could be very exciting. And that's an ambitious loan signing for me. Um, and then maybe 
maybe a, obviously a winger. I think winger will be on the agenda, I think, in my opinion. I think it'd be a travesty if it wasn't. Uh, and I think maybe look at one more permanent midfielder, maybe a maybe a, an experienced defensive midfielder. So you've got someone that Matthew Craig can learn from, someone like a, a Giandro Fuchs from Peterborough United maybe would be a fantastic signing uh, with him out of contract as well. That'd be a good permanent acquisition as well. So I'd say a creative midfielder, a pacey direct winger, like a Malik Wilkes mould, not exactly that player, but I think that mould of winger because that's what Grant McCann was working with last time. And then maybe an experienced midfielder, a holding midfielder or a defensive midfielder. So there's still two or three names I could see uh, come into the club and still two or three moulds of players coming into the club. Um, but it's been a decent start. And for Rovers fans that were complaining about the lack of experience in the first three signings, Grant McCann highlights at the owners' event that he was looking for young lads with legs and a lot of pace because of the experience we already have in the squad. We will invest in experience in the summer to replace the experience that goes in the summer, but in, in January, of course. But his focus, his main focus is on young lads with pace, energy and legs and stamina that's going to work in the current formation. And if you fit that criteria with the signs we've made and the signs we may be after in terms of names linked to the club, I think it's nothing but positive. Oh, definitely. Uh, again, outside his perspective. So I'm unsure about every single player in every position but you know you've got these players up front that if you are to bring in more forwards they'll learn from you mentioned that uh grant mccann wants these young players these are uh, people who can learn but also have that passion to get into football and i think you've kind of uh i think doncaster have that kind of nailed on plan here for the definite short term and like you mentioned long term is bringing experience for experience but you know, hopefully there'll be a uh, dipping, uh, raising quality, not a dipping quality. That wouldn't be beneficial. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the 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 plan that you've got from kind of my uh, outlook of it looks to be having that extra cover just in case you're in that uh, worry of injury again. So you'll have even more of a reason to not uh, use that as an excuse. Uh, yeah, it seems to be a, a good transfer plan. And I don't know our transfer plan. We haven't brought in any names yet, but as of right now potentially just keeping hold of the players like you said to me before we uh really mm -hmm. start recording just keeping hold of the players we've got we've had players that have been linked away with moves whether they're true or not will be a uh, different question but in terms of our additions i'd like to see very similar to what doncaster are doing bringing in cover but there's potentially one or two positions i'd like to improve on potentially yeah. An extra striker, a, a dedicated finisher, which is something I, I think a lot of Newport fans have been uh, out for for weeks is that we can make chances. We play brilliant football, but every now and again, we just lack that a uh, clinical edge up front. So with Omar Vogel, one of our kind of key players in that uh, role for a lot of the season, with him being out for the next few weeks, it'll be a, a struggle if we can't find someone to uh, fit in that mould of a player, if not more of a dedicated finisher, because... Omar Bogle's name rings a bell as well, doesn't it? That, that name <laughs> rings an absolute bell with Rovers fans. Um, one, what, what, one thing I liked, though, as well, about the three signs that we've made is we've brought in people that know how to win things. McGrath and I think Carty as well, you know, were part of the St. Pat squad that won the FAI Cup, that won the, uh, the FA Island Cup. And Matthew Craig is the captain of the under-21 Spurs squad. Yeah, we've got people who want to win things and you've got people who, you know, lead and have got leadership qualities. So the, we've been very smart in terms of who we want to recruit. And like we say, it, bring, it brings me on to a fantastic point that's been made numerous times by Ainsley, that's been made by numerous times by other people. The first time Grant McCann was here, he was just sprinkling the magic quality of loans over the foundations built by Darren Ferguson. Grant McCann is having to build the foundations himself now. It's going to take a hell of a lot longer than just one year to turn this around, especially with the last two or three years at the club. And what I will also say is this, when we look at the teams that are in the top of the division right now, the likes of Mansfield, the likes of Stockport, the likes of Wrexham, despite the money they spent, Barrow, despite the fact they've not got the biggest budget in the league, the main common denominator between all those five teams at, at the moment, there's more teams, but there's uh, those five teams in particular, they've all spent at least two or three years together. So the main thing here, and I think there's a lack of it in modern football, is time and patience. Um, 
I'm not saying drop your standards, but what I am saying is expecting consistency while we sort out the current situation. And I'm not saying we shouldn't demand positive results, but what I am saying is um, we have to take time for the inconsistency to weed out. This year might not be our year. I'm man enough to admit that. But next year or the year after might end up being our year because we give this man time to build the squad he wants to build. And we trust the process. And I know it's the, an overused statement in football at the moment, but trust the process. You know, we're, we're, we're not we're not Arsenal. We're not at this massive multiple winning club that's dropped our standards for four years because they haven't won a trophy because of like a certain manager. We're Dunkster Rovers. We've not won a trophy in 10 years. We haven't got to the chat. We haven't been in the championship for over a decade. History tells us and history more than more than ever tells us that we are historically a League One, League Two football club. We're in the division or a roundabout in the division that historically tells us where we need to be. But to get back into League One, which is the division where I think we should be, and I think that I'd like to see us go into long term, is we've got to give it time and patience. And I think we will get there at some point. It's just going to take a couple of years because, you know, and there's been, when we've been on our, our bad patch of form, there have been fans and there have been fans in our fan base that have said, get rid of this manager. And I question why anyone ever thought that because, first of all, Grant McCann's done wonders with us before. Secondly, he's only been in the job six months. I don't know why people during our bad patch of form, some Rovers fans, not everyone, but the couple odd one or two or a few um, in the de deep, dark depths of the fan base were saying get rid of him because of the results. And, you know, oh, all these teams have got rid of our manager. You know, if we get rid of him, it's going to improve the results. But what's the plan after that? The plan is to back McCann for the next two, three seasons at the very least and going forward as well. So, that's why I don't think Rovers are in a crisis. I don't think we're in a crisis. If we finish below 18th, okay, okay. But in terms of performance levels, we've made progress from last season. So I'm not worried because we've not gone down. We're not going up. As long as we stay in this division, maybe nick a Bristol Street Motors trophy out of it, then we'll get there. It's just going to take time and patience. And I think in modern football, we we lack time and patience. And I think that's what's what's needed. I think clarity and context is what, what's needed in situations like ours. I think that Salford need time with Carl Robinson. I think you guys um are building a good squad at the moment. You guys need time with with Graham Coughlin, and you'll be you'll be back up into them lead two players before you know it. So it's going to take a lot more time. And the best thing about it is next season, we're going to have the advantage. Me, you, other teams are going to have the advantage over the teams that come down from League One this season, the likes of uh, Fleetwood, they're going to have to rebuild again. The likes of Cheltenham, who might go down. Reading, who are under financial destruction. Um, multiple teams who could go down this year, we're going to have the advantage over them because, because we've had longer together and they're going to have to rebuild to get out of this division and they're going to have to start from square one again. So that's why I'm more confident about next season and that's why I'm not worried about where we finish this season. And I think that, like I said, in modern football, time and patience is what's needed and I think clarity and context is very much needed in situations like ours, in Newports, in Salford at the minute, Colchester under Danny Cowley and Nicky Cowley. I think that clarity and context is 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 needed, but I don't think modern football has seen a lot of that. I I'm always speechless in those uh, kind of in the things you've said there because that's the thing I've been trying to say towards uh, you know the Newport fan base towards just kind of football in general. There's no patience within uh, certain fans; they just want immediate success, and like you said, they don't take a uh, clarity and context of where the club is off the field and on the field and it tends to always lead to this uh, toxic relationship between the fan base, which at the end of the day isn't going to help the players. Uh, yeah. I'm very much one up for, you know, you can say that a team has a bad performance. You, you know, it's no secret if your team loses comfortably, you've kind of got to say we didn't play well. But I'm very much one to say you won't, don't slander names because, you know, they're footballers are their own biggest critics, managers, uh, their own biggest critics and i think they're in the hardest job of all in football because at the end of the day they realistically get all of the uh stick if things don't go well they're called to leave instead of players for the most part anyway and yeah there's just I'm, a lot of bizarre situations 
I'm I'm literally doing my coaching badges at the moment, and you know I've got this I've got this terrible worry in the back of my mind going into football management because if I don't get it right with a certain team in the future, I'm going to get absolutely pounced for it uh, with my reputation sometimes. So I know exactly what's going to happen in management, and I'm terrified for it. And it's it's a very difficult job, especially in modern football when people want instant success, and there's more of a need in society for instant success, otherwise you're out of a job. Um, I think it really started coming along in terms of this whole instant mentality. I think it came along about a decade or so ago. I think this need for, and this society change for instant success came about in the last decade or so, and it's become even more ruthless now. Um, and I think it reflects on today's society as well, especially in this country, I think, and, and, and in the UK in general. I think that the way football moves in terms of they want instant success, they want instant results. If they don't get it within six months, you're gone. End of story. I think there's a real movement in the last decade in society in general, which is reflected in football, about the need for instant success, instant results, and a lack of clarity, context, and patience. And I think... It reflects in the way football works as a business rather than a sport nowadays. And I think that's very, very key to to make people aware of. Oh, definitely. And um, I think, I don't know how similar this is to the uh, Doncaster situation, but a lot of things I've read from, you know, the odd one or two Newport fan who would potentially want Cock and uh, would say that we're an awful club and we're going down and this and that. <laughs> it, which, yes, I've heard, believe it or not. Um, and whether you've heard this as well, it, it could oh, be yeah. a, a relatable kind of thing in that regard. Oh, and yes. I, I understand why the frustration happens, because in your context, you've been in the Championship League One. In our context, we've been right next to going up to League One. And there's in, in that regard, and if you look at the progress that potentially we've made from those playoffs to now, you look at it outside of things without any context and anything else, and you go, why isn't this club consistently reaching playoffs if they've done it, you know, twice in the past uh, kind of three years in that context? Why have they not uh, kind of kept that roll up and go uh, continuously mm -hmm. kind of going up? But clarity yeah. and context in football, I think, is the most important thing within the seasons that we didn't go up. We lost a lot of players. We had all this cup money that we had from all these runs that's gone it's an entirely different kind of way of football now because there's yeah. it's very different because we're very much relying and we have been relying on the fan ownership more than ever and that could be changing and you look into that into the uh, perspective of it's going to be a long-term project rather than a you know next six months next year kind of thing and you've kind of got to look that as much as i'm very much one for you know I'd absolutely love short-term success. I'd absolutely love it if we went up, you know, year after year or we were always there. But you've got to take into consideration that, uh, and as unfortunate as it is, we didn't win those uh, playoff finals, even though there, there was always the debates that uh, were we robbed by refereeing decisions and all this stuff. But in that context, and I think this is a thing in life, you kind of can't live on the past. And that's what a lot of the... Uh, Newport fans have been doing, whether it be a lot of football fans, they've been living on the past. If you take Arsenal, for example, of course, they used to uh, win yeah. the Premier League and be up there, and they're now in a situation where they're not winning the Premier League, even though last season they were there. So the, the kind of mindset that you should always be going for success, no matter what the circumstances are, it's admirable, but you kind of got to be realistic with it as well. Yeah, I do get fans' frustration. Look, we've got it in the fan base at our place as well. And, um, you know, I completely get the frustration not winning every week and, you know, not achieving trophies and going up and things like that. I get it. I completely get it. But at the end of the day, if someone can't afford to get promoted or if someone hasn't got the resources this season to get promoted, we've got to try and achieve the next best thing, which is getting us in a position where we will go up this year. And I've said this numerous times in videos that I've done. If I had the option of two, the first option being we go up straight away, we get we do we we spend whatever we do to get promoted, and we don't have anything to fall back on if we don't go up, and we waste all these resources and money, and then we haven't got anything to fall back on, we fall flat on our face if we don't go up. But if we go up, we go straight back down anyway. Or 
we put ourselves in a position where we prepare to go up in the next two, three seasons, and we are more sustainable off the pitch to be able to deal with League One consistently over multiple seasons and then progress that way. I'd take the second. I'd be willing to wait two, three years. I, I don't, <clears throat> for me, for me, I don't want instant success if it means we're going to fall flat on our backsides. I would rather wait until we're in a more sustainable position financially to be able to go up. I mean, you know, Terry Bramwell, the chairman, yes, he's a rich man, but we're not a bottomless pit. We haven't got tons and tons and tons of money. You know, he can only invest so much into the football club and it's his choice to invest whatever he needs to in the football club. We can't force him to invest money. It's his choice. And and that's why I respect our owners a lot more than than others because, you know, we don't throw money willy-nilly all over the place. We give ourselves a budget. If we need to invest in it, we, we invest whatever we need to to make it a little bit more sustainable. And in terms of promotion, I would rather much be in a healthier position, sustainable-wise, off the pitch to be able to win promotion, whether that be in two, three, four years' time, than go straight up and go straight back down again without having the resources to deal with it. So, um, like I say, I get frustration from fans, but I just think clarity and context. And the thing with Arsenal, right, is, and it's a bit of a difficult one with Arsenal because they spent £700 million. They, they spent a lot of money over four years and they've won one FA Cup. That's where context needs to come into it. It's like, right, you spent all this money, you've had four years and you've won one FA Cup when you could have won a Premier League, could have won a Champions League and you bottled two top four races in the space of four, three, four seasons as well. Bit of clarity on the Arsenal situation there because I, st- I I wasn't a fan of Arteta from day one, but I've I've openly said Arteta needs to go at the end of this season if they don't win any trophies and scrape top four because of the context that they've spent all this money in four years and they've won one trophy out of a possible 12, 16 in those four years. I mean, count this season especially as well. They could still win. Arsenal's still eligible for the Premier League and the Champions League, but City are going to win the Premier League, and the Champions League is going to be won by the likes of Bayern Munich or Real Madrid or Man City. So out of six, out of 12 to 16 trophies, they've won one in four years, and they spent £700 million. I think a bit of context needed with the Arsenal situation that Arteta just isn't the right man to win them trophies. Um, but from our perspective, I would much rather be in a healthier position off the pitch to achieve promotion financially and be able to spend for promotion in the next two, three seasons rather than waste money in one season, go up straight away or just miss out and fall flat on our face and go straight back down again and possibly be in a worse position in two, three years. I'd rather wait. I mean, yeah, you've you've seen it with... Uh... You know, I don't mean to single-handedly kind of mention clubs, but Forest Green, for example, they mm. went up, spent all this money, didn't stay up, lost a lot of key players, have made, had a transitioning period and what is arguably the most competitive league to, you'll probably see for another good few years. And at the end of the day, they just haven't uh, quite landed and they're in a lot more of their awful place than they were, you know, two, three years ago, as you've mentioned. But yeah, I suppose the Arsenal context of they've had their same manager for three or four years and then maybe Doncasters or Newports where, you know, our managers have been through tough times. They've not been here for the three, four wow. years to make a squad build together and have this consistency of playing together and knowing how to play with each other. And at the end of the day, you've got to kind of take those uh, two situations and potentially make them uh, different. But yeah, and it's, it's a thing gonna... where... Yeah, I was going to say... Where you've got yeah, I was going to say the biggest example as well in terms of context as well and and um, and biding your time and building yourself to a point where you can get promoted. Look at the clubs that have come out of the National League as well. Teams like Barrow, Harrogate, Notts County, uh, Chesterfield this season, Wrexham, um, albeit Wrexham spent a lot of money, they still bide their time and they still had the right person coming along at the right time to invest this money to be able to win promotion. And... You know, even last, even the season before they went promoted, you know, Wrexham still missed out in the semi-finals. What did they do? They spent money to invest and they had enough behind them to keep it stable, but still invest money to achieve promotion the following season. It was quite a tight title race with the Notts County side. who had been in the league for a few years and invested what was needed into Luke Williams to bring that squad together in the space of one season. Notts County is quite a rare example because they only did it in one year under Luke Williams because, of course, he replaced Ian Birchall the summer before last. And 
you know, Barrow's another one. They had what I think a year or two with Pete Well before promotion, and um, again they were, they achieved it brilliantly. Um, you know, I think Harrogate have had quite a long time with Simon Weaver, and with the help of his dad as chairman, they've invested a certain amount of money. They didn't have the biggest budget in the division, but they had enough in them to be able to take that step into the division by beating Feld in the playoff final. So. Um, so, yeah, so there's a few le National League sides that have made the jump. Obviously, Chesterfield this season is going to be the example where they've been in the league for quite a few years now and they've done what they need to do financially to get themselves in a position where they can successfully achieve promotion and keep it stable off the pitch as well. So I think the National League is the biggest breeding ground for, for your next League Two clubs because they've either come down, had a wake-up call and done it right, or it's new clubs that have come up with a lot of investment and taken their first step into the football league because of the investment they've received and for them stepping up their game from where they were in the lower divisions in non-league football. So I think the National League is the biggest breeding ground for, for for new clubs. And I think they've they've done things the right way, 100%. Oh, definitely. I can't uh, disagree with that at all. But, you know, I absolutely love talking about that, but we will just kind of go on to the game because, you know, this will last two, three hours otherwise and it's all <laughs> relevant. To, it's all relevant to the two clubs in one way or another, understandably so, but, you know, one of, the, one of those things at the end of the day. So in terms of the game, of course, we've got it a Saturday at your ground. The, uh, the first game that we played, of course, the reverse fixture ended very much comfortably, you know, us being up 3-0 in half hour and winning 4-0. How do you see this game going? Because, of course, there's a different ground, there's a different atmosphere. You've had the uh, opportunity to bring in more players when, realistically, we haven't brought in anything. So do you expect a very different kind of uh, setup in the way you play against us in comparison to uh, how you did when you came to our place? And do you expect it to go differently in terms of a result? I do expect the game to be different 100%. Uh, I think when we looked at that game earlier on in the season, we were still a newer team. We were still gelling together. We were still trying to find our balance. Uh, we has, we still had injury problems at the time. Um, we had players in there that weren't going to be a part of the plans going forward. We knew that. And, you know, we we looked at that game and we, we reacted from that. You know, Forest Green was our first win of the season. So games like Newport where we got trounced, you know, were games that we reacted to. And when you look at it from a coach perspective, because I'm trained to be a coach, I look at that first game at your place and I sort of look at that as, right, that's your breeding ground. That's your basis to work on for the reverse fixture. Look at what we did wrong there. This is how Newport are going to play. I don't think you'll differ from the style of football that you played against us the first time round. So when you look at the style of play, that's how we're going to be setting up against. We're going to set up in a different formation because we're going to set up with the 4-3-3. Um, we're going to have Craig maybe on maybe on the bench, maybe make his debut, we don't know. Um, we know that Carty will be on the bench probably. McGrath might start, might make his debut, uh, might be on the bench still. Uh, so when you look at it realistically, I could see us setting up in a couple of ways. We, I think we're going to go Jones in goal because Lawler's injured again, so uh, it'll be Lewis Jones in goal. But Jones, I think, doesn't get enough credit. I think he's been fantastic. I think he's, a, I think he commands his area quite well. He knows what to say. He makes save after save, and uh, he's, you know, he's barely made any mistakes. I think that it's the defence that's been more in front of him that's made the mistakes. Um, but the goalkeeper seems to get slandered for it, so uh, I think context again is needed. So I think Jones will probably be in goal. I think you'll probably expect a back four of maybe senior... Um, Olawu, Bailey and Sterry. I think there may be the only change to that back line maybe Olawu out for McGrath but that's only if Olawu doesn't start and they think McGrath should start this game so we'll see what happens with that one. If that's the case I'd probably expect a midfield of Klaus, Rowe and then maybe the either Biggins or Broadbent, or maybe even you put close next to row in front of a Matthew Craig in the sixth role. Um, and then maybe I'd look at a front three of Molyneux, Ironside, and then maybe on the left, either Hurst or Fal. Uh, I would rather Hurst start on the wing than Fal because he's not a winger. I think he works better as a striker, but Ironside's not getting dropped at the minute because he's been turning up. So, um, for me, I would start Hurst if he's fit, or we may look at bringing in a winger before before Saturday, if that's the case. But 
I don't know. I think that's probably what we're going to line up with. Um, I think, like I said, we will use the four nil as a as a as a basis and a foundation for where we we learn what we need to do in training. We uh, we look at Coughlin style of football, the long balls coming over the top, the cross in the box. Crossing the box have been one of your main things for your style of play. And crossing the box have been one of our main weaknesses this season. It's defending crosses from the box, into the box, and how we set up to, to defend crossing the box. So if we're getting caught on the counter and you're about to set up crossing the box, how do we put the men in a specific position in that box to defend that to defend that cross? Set pieces again, another big weakness. How we defend set pieces, corners, free kicks, throws, penalties, etc. Obviously, penalties, obviously the gun to the goalkeeper. But the other parts of set pieces, how do we defend that? How do we set up? How do we acknowledge the situation? How do we go one step beyond the opposition in those situations in terms of set pieces and crosses in the box? So that's going to be our biggest thing there. How do we defend the crosses in from into the box? And I think if we defend them, we'll win the game. If we can't get them clear and we can't defend crosses in the box and set pieces, you'll probably win the game. And I think it may be on crosses in the box and how we track back from the long balls and how we also counter what Newport are trying to do as well. Because when you've got a side like Newport who put those crosses in the box, do well at set pieces... Uh, when you've got a Newport side who play it long and try and get it forward a lot of the time, you know, it's going to be a very interesting watch to see how we deal with that. Because if we can't break them down on the counter and we can't counter onto that, I mean, we, on our best day, we'll set up as a high line of press and we'll press as high as we can to win the ball back and as quick as we can as well. If we get caught out with the high press, we could be done for before the, the shots even come in or the cross in the box even come in. So we've got to be very, very careful about how Newport play because we could get counted a lot more in this game and a lot more than people think. Um, I expect you guys to have the majority of the ball uh, because as it is, it's a long ball team. Even though you put, even though you pump it long, I do expect you to guy, uh, guys to either go, go long all the time and kind of just pump it forward and not really keep the ball for as long as, as possible. Or you may keep it for longer. You may end up looking at us as a side that you can play off the park and you can look to play through the channels and then maybe play the long ball from either the middle or switch the play from either side. So I think it's, it's going to go one of two ways. I think it's going to be either we get counted and beaten by two goals to nil or if we play our game right and counter the long balls from you lot very, very well. I could see us winning by two goals to nil, but um, I think it's going to be very interesting. Hopefully it's better than the the 3-1 defeat last season at our ground and definitely the 4-0 uh, at your ground earlier in the season. I'd, 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 take a, I'd take a repeat of the last time we came to your ground before last this season. I'd, cut, I'd take a 1-0 I'd win uh, by a right back. Um, but um, but yeah, I think it'll I think it'll go one or two ways depending how we set up defensively and how we counter your counter your attacking uh, attacking talent as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think it's it's one of those that goes two ways. I think it is two. Even though we've played the long ball, we played the long ball against you. Evidently, it worked. One of the things that I've kind of seen and a lot of a lot of Newport fans have seen when we play the long ball is that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, those long balls are directed to the injured man, Omar Bogle. He plays more of a of a false nine just behind Seb Pamo than Will Evans, and that tends to uh, mean our attacks may not have many passes, but they happen really quick. And we adapted to the loss of Bogle or at least attempted to against Eastleigh, against uh, Barnet, and all these uh, other clubs where, as opposed to playing long balls, trying to just hit you on the break as fast as possible, instead yeah. of that, I've seen a lot more passing kind of happening, a lot more slow, patient build-up play. Either that or very similar to how you play. You have a very high defensive line, you press for the ball. We did that against... Uh, Sutton, for example, and that was, I believe, either just before or just after Doncaster, and we won comfortably. So, in my eyes, there's probably three ways we can play. We either play the long ball like we did when we faced you in the uh, kind of reverse game here. We either play how we did against Eastley, against uh, Barnet, and the league games we've had since Bogle have been, has been gone, and that is a, a lot slower, a lot more passing movements, a lot more players being involved in attacks, and 
it works really well because our players, I think, are really, you know, consistent with passing. They're very knowledgeable of where to place themselves to make sure that we're going to be safe if we do misplace a pass and we're broken on the counter. We're very uh, decent in my eyes, a lot better than the beginning of the season anyway in stopping attacks and being able to make sure that we kind of close players down and close the press down before we end up getting uh, broken on it. But at the end of the day, and it was one of the things that we said after the Eastley game, it's one of the things that I said after the Eastley game, and it's one of the things that I mentioned that we need in January, is a striker, a dedicated number nine who can just get on the end of the chances because we play really attractive football. We're very good to you know switch transition from a defence to attack. We're good at using the, the pitch to utilise all the space, but the issue comes when we get into the box. You'll either have somebody who maybe, maybe Will Evans or... Palmer Holden, for example, not quite place themselves perfectly for getting on the end of maybe just a drag back into the box, or potentially we just get one on one and potentially just miss that chance. So I think a lot of it, I, I'd like to say that we set up it as a kind of fallback because Graham Cochran's mentioned he prefers that, whether that be Lewis Payne, Shane McLaughlin, Delaney, and then uh, Clark at the back four. You have then Scott Bennett. Kind of, kind of playing a six in that regard, kind of just uh, behind Morris and Chastney in the midfield, or potentially Morris also drops back. So you have those two uh, holding midfielders, but that then brings the issue of do we have enough quality to break at you on transitions? It'll be interesting. I'd imagine Will Dig will get into the uh, role, get into the team potentially trying to play similarly to how Vogel does, but the question is does he have the physical presence to be able to do that? It's not quite the same in terms of stature and everything. And then the front two's obvious, Will Evans and Seth Palmer Holden. But I think we'll play differently to how we played you when we uh, obviously beat you towards the beginning of the season. Because of the injuries we've had, because the, the players have been able to kind of adapt to themselves and not have to rely on the long ball, so to speak, as much as they uh, had done previously. And it could be very interesting. It could be a, it is, it'll be an interesting watch. I think it is, for the most part, two very different styles of football. It all depends how we deal with your potential press, deal with the uh, ways that you want to break us yeah. down, whether you utilize the wings and all this stuff. We tried to do that against Eastley. We utilized them brilliantly for one half. And then the second half, we changed it up almost as an uh, experimental thing when they went down to a 10 men. Didn't quite work out, but. It's a lot put down to the fact that we just couldn't finish chances. And at the end of the day, goals win games. I expect us to be a lot more offensively kind of uh, dominant than defensively if we are to score. And I think more than any game in terms of the ones we played in the league this season, whoever scores first, that is going to be potentially the one that goes on to win the game. Because I think these teams, the Newport and Doncaster, don't respond overly positive to going 1-0 down. In terms of we've went 1-0 down, our heads have dropped at the back, we've kind of lost focus on what we've been doing, and we'll yeah. lose you know, 2-3-0, all these kind of things. We'll potentially get a goal back in a kind of rare circumstance, we'll be able to reset. But for the most part, you know, the majority of the time, I can't say we respond overly positive to uh, going down uh, a goal. And then very I'd, similar I'd, with... Uh, yeah, yeah, very, I'd, very I'd say I'd say we were pretty similar sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes as well, where sometimes we might let our heads drop at 2-0 um, or if we bring it back and we concede 2-1 and then we can see maybe 3-1 and uh, our heads drop after that. And, uh, you know, there has been instances of dropping our heads from goals, not all the time, thankfully, but, but sometimes. And then you mentioned it there about your different styles of play. I think if you play you pass it a lot more comfortably around each other and just start playing it around and, you know, a bit slower it could end up being an MK Don situation where we just press you and you know you might end up losing it a lot more often than usual and it could end up being a 2-3-0 depending on how we turn up attacking wise um if you play a lot more quicker with the with the pressing of your own we've got to be switched on at the back because if we lose focus for even a second uh, when we're under pressure we, it could be 2 3 nil to Newport. So, um, like I say, it could go a million different ways, uh, depending on how you guys turn up uh, tactics-wise and how we turn up tactics-wise. Yeah, I, definitely. I think the, uh, the final thing I kind of want to say in terms of the game is that the uh, the change of atmosphere, the change of ground is going to be a, a thing that I see very uh, 
influential to this game. We've got, for the most part, uh, an atrocious record away. We're a lot better at home than we are away. And it's understandable why. Uh, I know the context of the, of the statement of 12th man. Some people have said it's very cliche and isn't real, but I personally think it is. I think if you're yeah. quite literally at your home ground, it could go very differently. But in the same way, it could go positive or negative. If you don't start off on the front foot well, you know, I don't know how your fans react to that kind of stuff. But yeah. I've seen fans uh, where if you don't start off well, it's it's not a positive reaction from the fans. And they kind of... Uh, are very quick to get on the jump on players' backs, and mm. at the end of the day, very similar to what I was saying earlier about not criticizing individuals. I'm sure criticizing players for you know not starting the game off well also doesn't help them in the same way that criticizing them afterwards isn't going to motivate them to uh, improve. But yeah, I think realistically, the first kind of 10 minutes could dictate this game. If a goal is to go in, if momentum goes one team's way, it could very much be a uh, a situation of just whoever scores first, whoever has this control in the opening parts of the game could potentially control a lot of it. We had the Wrexham game. We controlled it for the first half, didn't score. And at the end of the day, it was switched. The atmosphere changed at that ground and we got a, we got punished for the chances we didn't take. So I think one, I'd, you know, we've been playing this passing game, but I'd like to see us compete with you in the pressing game because we did it against Sutton earlier on in the season that worked. I'd like to see that. Whether it happens is going to be a different thing. We could potentially go for this whole passing around and uh, finding options again. And it all depends how our players react to being pressed and if they have the composure to uh, deal with it at the end of the day. So I'd like to say I, I'm confident personally. You know, what football fan would I be? What Newport fan would I be if I didn't back my team to win every single game? So I'm going to say, I'm going to say we score first. But I am going to say that you score just out of out of the uh, home advantage in that respect. And I'm going to say 2-1. I don't think it'll be a uh, walkover game by any means. I think you've, you've definitely shown in recent weeks that you have the ability to respond a lot better to negative things that happen on the pitch. You're a lot better tactically, I think. What I also noticed in the uh, you know the reverse fixture is that you didn't use Joe Ironside. You were 3-0 yeah. down by the time you brought him on and... I, you know, I've said it and I praise that signing because he's very much what I'd like to see a Newport dedicated to finish of kind of that role. So, yeah, it all depends how you line up, if you utilize, you know, your strongest 11 in that respect. And I think personally, us losing Bogle is huge because it was very much a way that we were able to dismantle you. I don't think he got on the score sheet, but I think just his influence that he had really helped kind of bring these goals yeah. out in the game. And, at the end of the day, I think he's a huge loss, but I still will say we win 2-1 because I'm a footballer uh, fan that really wants to uh, obviously see my team do well. But the realistic part of me says it could be just 2-0 either way. It just all depends how the game starts. Yeah. Um, in terms of a scoreline, what I'm going to go with, I mean, like I say, it could go multiple different ways, but I'm... Confident we're going to get a reaction, especially after the Harrogate game. Um, so I'm going to go, and we don't really keep clean sheets as much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with the reverse of last season. I'm going to go with a 3-1 win uh, for us. So instead of a 3-1 defeat for us, it, like last year, it'll be a 3-1 win, I think. Um, I think Ironside won't play as deeper as he was at Harrogate. I think he'll be in the right position. Um and I think that we're going to be in a much more reactive position. I think it'll be... I think the first half could be to and fro. I think the Newport could have their spells, definitely. But I think we're going to come out much better in the second half. Um, and I think we're going to... I think we're going to... I think, it, I think I'd think i say maybe a half-time scoreline of 1-0 Newport and then maybe a 3-1 win by full-time. So uh, I'm going to go with, going to go with 3-1. I'm going to say we're going to get a reaction from last week. Yeah, you know what? I, I can see why you say that, but obviously I'm not going to want to kind of uh, <laughs> agree with it by any means. But I think the final thing I will mention, um, of course, was the FA Cup draw. Uh, I'm sure you would have seen it. Yeah, We've got a replay on Tuesday against Eastleigh. And should we win that? Should we win that? We've got we've got a home tie against Manchester United, which... You've won. You've won. Is, You've won. Which is the fifth round free pass. But uh, 
you've won. The end you've, of- you've won. Trust me, trust me, you've won. United are going to come there thinking they're going to walk all over you and you're going to show them exactly what's what because that's what my United players sometimes will do. It's not on the manager at United. It's on those players because consistently they've not been to the level that they should be. And what's going to happen is going to turn up thinking they're going to walk all over this and Newport's going to show them exactly how to play proper football and not do it up at the back and not miss a load of chances. You're going to take your chances and you're going to knock out Manchester United. I've got full faith in you for doing that. Listen here now, man. We've got Eastley first and I'm generally more <laughs> worried about... you got to understand, I'm more worried about facing Eastley than I am United because no Eastley's matter what the result is, you know, should we beat United? Should we lose to United? We're winning anyway because the revenue that game is going to build for the club, regardless of anything, is oh. huge. So uh, the reason I mention it, and it, it's a pretty it's a pretty naive one potentially for me to say, but it is something you've got to take into a perspective and it could be a very realistic thing. Are the players' minds going to be set 100% on what can we do against Doncaster? And I think the perspective of the fact that literally, you know, three days later, we've got the potential to win a game and face United. It could, because there's always the possibility. I'd imagine that Graham Cotham, because he mentions that he likes to take games one step at a time and he doesn't focus too far forward. I'd hope that he's been able to keep the players' heads level and be able to uh, get them to focus on this game. But at the same time, you can't deny the kind of excitement that uh, that game brings to fans yeah. and undoubtedly players. But I, I hope that it doesn't have any form of influential factor. I hope we still go there. We still go to your place, still act professionally and get a professional result. Because I'd like to say we, if results go our way, if uh, we win and all this other stuff, we could be 16 points clear of the drop, which considering where we were at the start of the season, all the worries, you know, from Newport fans alike and just football fans alike, it's a phenomenal achievement. And it's one of the things where even if we go to your place and lose, uh, I'm always uh, optimistic in the regard that we've done a phenomenal job in regard to stuff. And that doesn't excuse if we perform awfully because, you know, mm. you, it's just something that you never really want to see. But at the end of the day, we've done far above any expectations but at the same time i i want to see how far we can take it i don't expect any higher than mid-table i don't expect any lower than than a 22nd at the end of the day but one of those things where i'm incredibly happy with how the seasons went very much a uh a historic one for for many a ways whether it be the ownership or the potential for this draw uh in the cup and to, in real, in realistic terms, if we can push higher up the table and beat the teams around us, of course, Doncaster being the prime example, because you're literally right next to us on the table. I believe it's goal difference that separates us. Mm. At the end of the day, if we can go there and get a positive result, you know, and then go play easily, get a positive result there, I'll be absolutely over the moon. But I think this game, it, it's a lot of a, a tactician, you know, battle, two different styles of football. But also, it's very much a headspace kind of thing. Do you want to respond to, you know, your poor potential recent form or your inconsistent form? We obviously want to win out of just being more safe and more secure and uh, making the club a lot more ambitious and a lot more nice to look at. If you're Hugh Jenkins, who uh, apparently is days away from being official owner of the club, which is incredibly exciting. So at the end of the day, I hope we go into it with the mentality of take this game, put every bit of seriousness into it and get a result because, yeah. you know, you always put the league first. But at the same time, I would entirely understand and kind of get if we went there and kind of just, you know, they're like, yeah, this this game's fine, but we got a, we you know, we got the potential to play United. And I'd imagine we'd be professional. I'd imagine we will go and uh, be 100% committed to this game. but. You know, I think it's a relevant point to mention just because it's a very unique thing for a uh, a League Two club to be in, in terms of the situation. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I do think the minds will be on will be on Saturday, but obviously, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting because the replay on on you know three days after that with Eastley, I think Eastley, 
you know, they're a National League club, they're a decent club, and, you know, there is the opportunity for that exit. But, you know, it could be very Newport to lose on Saturday and then beat Eastleigh. It could also be very Newport to win on Saturday and lose to Eastleigh. So it could go either way on in either day. But all I mean, all I'll say is, um, you know, we've got our memories as well from this season, despite it being a, a lower finish than perhaps many would have liked. But we've still got our memories. We've still got Grant McCann back as manager. We've still made progress in the league. We've got potential Bristol Street Merch trophy on the horizon. We've we we almost knocked out Everton. We almost knocked out Peterborough. We've got the memories from that. I was there for the Everton game. I was there at Peterborough for the FA Cup clash, where we almost took it to extra time. Um, and, you know, for Newport fans, this would be a fantastic season, considering where the predictions were at the start of the season for most people. Um, and all I'll say for the uh, for the Eastley game is uh, is good luck to you. Or in or in Welsh, uh, Pob Lewick Ichi. Uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. But, uh, but yeah, Pob Lewick Ichi. So good luck to you. You know what? But you know what? I respect that. That's a that's a that's a, that's a lot of a better attempt than a lot of people that I ask if they can uh, try and pronounce Welsh words like the Welsh uh, name for Newport Cat If people go go and, and like repeat it because it, it's a very uh, you know it, it's been a relevant thing with the Welsh. I, I thought I'd bring a Welsh. I thought I'd bring a bit of Welsh. I thought I'd bring a bit of Welsh to the Welsh audience. Uh, Pop the Willie. Yeah. You know what? You've smashed it. Fair play, but. Uh, yeah, I really hope that we go into this, and regardless, I hope I I'm sure it will be a good game. It'll be an entertaining one to watch, and you know you can look at these kind of games, 18th, 19th, and go, who cares? Nobody like they're not near danger, they're not near uh, promotion. Who cares? But I think the uh, like you like we've said and you know mentioned many times on this, the perspective and everything of where both clubs are, of what both clubs want to achieve. This game is a uh, equally as massive for both clubs uh yeah I'll, I'll say enjoy the game don't enjoy it too much um uh, you know I, i'm sure you know there's a potential that we could that i'll see you because of course i'm coming to a yeah to don pasta which is one of the reasons that i'm extra excited for this game because I absolutely love a football away day i've been into a lot more of them this season that i uh realistically would have planned Salford was very much a last minute one as uh, miserable as that game was but yeah yeah and, you know enjoy the game I'm sure it'll be a great occasion but uh don't enjoy it too much at the end of the day <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and enjoy it as best I can and um Diolkia Fuanian so thank you very much I love that I love that so yeah I think you know unless you want to kind of mention anything else I think we can kind of just wrap it up there yeah um like i said thank you very much for having me on um like i said i can't wait to see you at the ground on saturday um i can't wait for my next away day bradford city on the 20th i've got the train tickets i've got my uh, match ticket um i'm ready for valley parade on the 20th um and then uh otter blackpool in march uh so i'm missing walsall away for that one Alton Towers on the 16th, so I'm missing Walsall for that one. It might be the other way around. It might be Walsall and Swindon I'm missing out on, but I've already done those stadiums, so, uh, you know, not too big a loss. Sutton on the 3rd of February as well, so I'm looking forward to Sutton United away as well. Um, and, yeah, there's quite a few games I'm looking forward to, so uh, so it should be a good few months. But, uh, but yeah, thanks for having me on. And, uh, and yeah. Uh, best of luck to, for the rest of the season to the Newport County Football Club uh, Association Football Club and of course everyone out there in Wales so thank you. I absolutely love that so uh, yeah I'll chuck your Twitter link and your YouTube link and everything else in the description probably top line in all honesty or at least below all of the uh, mentioning of what we talk about anyway so uh, yeah thank you very much for taking the you know hour and ten minutes this is by far the longest we that I've ever done one of these uh podcast i think the longest we had previously it's a, I've, to be fair since i've switched the format we had the first one that was 20 minutes long second one 25 um the one the stockport one with with hannah was 35 40 minutes we're now an hour 10 minutes who knows? My next one could be near two hours. It's, oh, I, I, think this, I, think this, I think this is the longest you're going to get. I think this is the longest you're going to get. With 
<laughs> no, you know what? I, I've really enjoyed it anyway, and I've it's one it. of the things that that I set out to do when I did this. I didn't want to just talk about the dedicated fixture, but you know, it's it's two football fans that love the game and just want to kind of talk about it. So that's equally what it is in that same regard. So, uh, yeah, should you have made it through the hour and ten minutes of a uh, lovely football talk, a like and a subscribe would be very much appreciated. Comment your uh, thoughts on the fixture. Uh, down below thank you to chal as always for the uh appearance and you know potentially we, we might have a a little review of this game i know i don't do many reviews but depending on how this game goes and if i enjoy it as a positive result i might do a review but you know irregardless really enjoyed this like and subscribe and share support the channel whatever way you see fits using the link in the description and yeah take care it's off for now